All right, guys, we are back for the second part of uh, this uh, lecture on environmental crime. And uh, for the second half, you know, first half we talked about wildlife crime. In the second half, we're going to talk about uh, pollution and chemical dumping. Um, now, pollution, just air pollution alone, uh, has been estimated to cause 2 million premature deaths every year across the world. 2 million. Um, that is a, an extremely large number, um, and that is uh, only likely to rise, excuse me, only likely to rise uh, as time goes on. Now, some of the worst environmental crimes, uh, uh, dumping, pollution-related crimes uh, in history, I'm just going to talk about a couple of them. Uh, the first being the BP oil spill. So back in 2010, um, the uh, I can't remember the name of the, the oil platform, but there was an oil platform just off the, the Gulf Coast in the United States, um, and there was an explosion, uh, uh, a, a giant fire, 11 people that worked on the, the oil rig died, um, and 780,000 cubic meters of oil were released into the Gulf of Mexico before the leak was finally stopped. Now, 780,000 cubic meters. If you imagine, you know, for the Americans out there, a meter is slightly longer than a yard. So we're talking three feet and change. Now a cube that big, 780,000 of those oil just released into the ocean uh, killed uh, untold amounts of wildlife uh, destroyed untold numbers of tourism dollars for the Gulf Coast. Um, and essentially the cause of the problem was, very simplistically, uh, 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 cutting corners. Corporations not wanting to pay for safety, uh, wanting to do it the cheap way, uh, not caring about the possible repercussions. Um, but not a single person involved in any of those decisions that caused 11 deaths and untold uh, environmental destruction have served any prison time at all. Probably the biggest pollution crime uh, in human history was the Union Carbide plant in 1984. So essentially, uh, Union Carbide was, had a, a, a giant chemical plant in the city of Bhopal, India. Uh, which is, and it was located in a very, very, very poor area of the city um, where you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of, of people were packed into very small geographic area. Uh, and in 1984, there was a massive chemical spill slash leak, uh, and thousands of people died. Estimates range from roughly 2,000 to roughly 8,000 people died. Uh, in the immediate aftermath of that, and then many more thousands died uh, kind of long term based on their exposure. Uh, roughly half a million people suffered some kind of injury from exposure to these incredibly toxic chemicals. Um, it's even to the point where even now in the 21st century, if people uh, go to investigate the site where this happened, uh, they can easily get exposed to harmful or even deadly levels of chemicals. Um, essentially, you know, this, this entire plant and the area around it is a ghost town at this point because it's still contaminated uh, and still kind of completely unsuitable for human life. Um, in this case, the good news is a few of the people uh, kind of responsible for it were sentenced to prison a few decades after it happened, uh, but they were sentenced to, I think, two years, uh, but they never actually served it. Last I checked, um, they were sentenced, but never actually kind of punished with prison. Uh, something that's going to be increasingly an issue involving pollution in the modern world is e-waste, i.e. electronic waste, i.e. television, computers, laptops, uh, you know, Fitbits, and uh, all these different electronic devices are becoming more and more and more of a pollution issue. One of the problems is lots of the chemicals used to make these products are incredibly long-lasting and incredibly harmful. 
I mean, just the plastic alone, uh, having, you know, most of these devices are encased in plastic, and that plastic, of course, breaks down into small pieces, which then get into the ocean water. Um, the environmentalists uh, have been checking ocean water for microplastics, and they are founding a disturbing amount in the ocean water, which then means they find it in fish and other kind of consumable food items from the ocean, which we then consume. So we're consuming uh, large amounts of these little tiny pieces of plastic um, that is all from this dumping process. Uh, then the electronics themselves often involve uh, hazardous chemicals. Um, the one piece of bright spot here, the one piece of good news, is that a lot of the metals used to create electronics are also valuable. So there's, you know, in, in lots of electronic uh, uh, devices, there's a little bit of gold and silver. Um, so lots of people are looking into recycling these things uh, to, to get those valuable minerals out. Um, and hopefully they'll be able to find a way to isolate the, the harmful chemicals as part of that process. Uh, in addition, uh, this isn't exactly environmental crime, uh, but I, I couldn't be me without at least talking about it. There's the issue of data security. So a lot of people don't understand how much of their personal data gets stored on electronic devices. And then if you throw it away, anybody who wants to can kind of pick it up uh, and read or scan that data. And this is everything from computer and laptop hard drives um, printers, a lot of people don't know this, but like uh, printer copier things often used in businesses, uh, those save essentially everything that you've ever scanned or copied on them somewhere. So if you're a business or you have one of these um, high quality uh, uh, printers and you throw it away, anybody who wants to can pull that out of the trash and retrieve every single piece of paper you've ever printed or scanned or copied. And I'm betting that there's lots of, of private information on those devices that you don't want other people to see. So um, we have to be careful of uh, recycling these products, uh, making sure that any good data is unrecoverable, uh, which if you want to know how to do that, please uh, take my cybercrime course. Um, and making sure that we're disposing of these things properly uh, to prevent both traditional crime and uh, pollution slash environmental crime. One of the more disturbing issues is nuclear material. Okay, uh, nuclear material, um, whether it's from the processing of nuclear weapons in the seven or nine countries that have nuclear weapons at this point, um, or from nuclear power plants, or from experimental nuclear stuff. Um, that creates waste. And the bad news is, uh, especially the, the uh, older nuclear power plants uh, and older ways of purifying and extracting nuclear material results in a lot more waste than modern nuclear power plants and nuclear reactors produce. Uh, and that waste uh, from the older plants especially, but even some from the newer plants can last and be hazardous to human life for tens of thousands of years. So we need to find a way to dispose of it safely, wisely, uh, and in such a way that it's not killing people today, tomorrow, or 5,000 years from now, which kind of creates a very unique situation in the field of uh, sanitation, in the field of what do we do properly and responsibly with waste. Unfortunately, that process is expensive. And as we know, um, it's not nice to, uh, you know, corporations do not uh, want to pay a bunch of money. So they try to find shortcuts. There have already been both countries and corporations that have been caught just taking this nuclear material that they're supposed to be uh, cleanly uh, and safely storing and disposing of and just dumping it into the ocean. That's a problem. Now, the good news is, the radiation for humans uh, is not that big a deal. The ocean is a very, very, very good job of uh, uh, diluting radiation uh, for 
to the point where it's no longer harmful for the humans, uh, even swimming in the ocean. Um, but the A, uh, uh, who's, who's to know who's going to dig that up a thousand years from now? B, there's lots of uh, wildlife that gets infected and killed by this nuclear material. Um, so dumping it into the ocean, uh, while better than, you know, burying it beneath a, an apartment complex, uh, is still incredibly damaging to the environment uh, and is illegal for a reason. But what's even more disturbing than dumping it into the ocean is when nuclear material goes missing. And unfortunately, <clears throat> especially with the fall of the Soviet Union uh, in the early 90s, there has been a lot of nuclear material that is supposed to be somewhere, but now it's gone. We don't know where it is. Uh, and disturbingly, the best case scenario for things like that is that it got dumped in the ocean somewhere. The worst case is that it's, you know, hidden in a warehouse in a populated area. And the really, really bad situation is uh, uh, some kind of uh, bad actors, terrorist groups or criminal groups, uh, can use it to make some kind of weapon. Now, it would be insanely difficult slash impossible to make an actual nuclear detonation device with uh, uh, nuclear uh, material that's missing and, you know, because usually it's waste product. Uh, but what you can make is a bomb that spreads radiation and how much radiation depends on how much nuclear material you have and what kind it is and all these things. Uh, but a bomb could spread nuclear material around, say, a city, making that city completely uninhabitable by humans for at least hundreds, if not thousands or tens of thousands of years. Um, so that's kind of the big nightmare scenario with this missing nuclear material is that somebody will deliberately use it to pollute some big city, uh, which would cause untold numbers of deaths, uh, economic damage, uh, cultural, uh, you know, uh, sites of, of importance could be rendered uninhabitable and, and unviewable. Um, so nuclear material is a huge, 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 huge issue. Um, again, the bright side of this uh, uh, process is that modern nuclear reactors, whether they're used for power or for research, uh, produce much less waste that is a danger to humans for a much shorter amount of time. Um, but it's going to take a while before that becomes the majority of the nuclear waste we're having to deal with. So here's where we're going to end this discussion of environmental crime. And... Uh, uh, what, what we're, we're kind of looking at on a global scale are three large issues. The first is criminogenic asymmetries. And I think I talked about this in a previous slide. But essentially what that means is globally, there are haves and there are have-nots. And the haves have an excess of demand for goods and an excess of waste. And the have-nots have an excess demand for money and an excess uh, 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 supply of goods and places where they can uh, store waste. So kind of in simplistic terms, there are many places around the world that um, you know, are poor and they send goods to the rich areas like elephant ivory and uh, uh, you know, uh, difficult to find or obtain uh, woods for furniture um, rhino horn and uh, endangered species and things, they send them to the rich countries in exchange for money. And then the rich countries send the poor countries their waste, whether it's nuclear waste or chemical waste or just regular old, you know, plastic household waste um, to these more poor areas, which in the short term earns them money, but in the long term is going to cause untold damage um, so, you know, from a crime perspective, it's very much, uh, internationally kind of the haves and the have nots and what your country sends out and what it takes in is going to be largely dictated, uh, by whether you're one of the haves or one of the have nots. Second thing we really need to focus on when it comes to environmental crime is the entanglement of business and government. So, 
a legitimate business especially, but even an illegal business, they don't want to do things the right way you, uh, in many cases because the right way costs money and they want more money. So they work with the government to do things like get rid of regulations that protect the environment. That way they can make a little bit more money uh, at the expense of the environment, but that doesn't matter when it comes to this quarter's profit. Um, they want to sell, uh, you know, ivory coated, uh, you know, ivory keyed pianos again. Uh, so they get the government to either make it legal or just to look the other way uh, when they import ivory and turn them into piano keys again. Uh, but the third thing we have to talk about and the thing that kind of brings it all together is consumerism. We, especially here in the West, but uh, uh, all over the world, uh, we want to consume. We have to have uh, the latest and greatest. We have to have the best. We have to have all the different um, uh, uh, products and you know the, the newest clothes and uh, the fanciest computers and you know a, a car that's not more than a year old. Uh, but what this means is it generates, A, a huge amount of waste. Uh, and that waste is more and more and more as we get into the modern era. Uh, that waste is going to last longer and longer and longer before it finally disappears or degrades. Um, but also, uh, uh, it means we're using resources that aren't infinite. There is not an infinite amount of oil in the world. There's not an infinite amount of uh, lumber in the world. There's not an infinite amount of uh, the products to make uh, uh, electronic devices, you know, all those different chemicals. There's not an infinite amount. Um, some of that, like lumber, we can uh, do in a, a way that, um, you know, it's generated just as fast or even hopefully faster than we're consuming it. Uh, but that's not done routinely. And this consumerism, this, this drive to always have more, 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 companies have to show not just the same profit as last quarter, but an increase over last quarter if they want to be seen as a healthy company. Um, that system cannot last. At some point, whether it's 10 years from now, 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now, um, we're going to have to stop this, the, the rapid expansion of consuming and production and all those things. Um, because that concept has become more and more popular uh, all over the world, many companies are performing what is kind of uh, non-affectionately known as greenwashing, where companies that are most responsible for the pollution and the destruction of the environment are now trying to make themselves seem green and hip. Uh, so this would be things like, um, you know, oil companies that, you know, uh, uh, pollute uh, 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 the air after the oil is burned and pollute the ground when they spill and, uh, you know, uh, they're responsible for, for untold amount of wildlife and even human deaths. Um, they'll put out commercials on TV that explain how much they love the environment and how they're investing $5 million in a new solar panel project, which is, you know, 0.00001% of their uh, uh, corporate income. So um, they're trying, many corporations are trying to make themselves seem like less of a environmental threat and environmental and, and less environmentally destructive than they are. Uh, one way they can, they can do this is find countries where there are no regulations send all their waste to that country and then say, oh, we would never break the law. And technically they didn't, but they still dumped a bunch of their chemical waste into the environment, which again, great, you didn't break any laws, um, but you still killed millions of you know, wildlife and, and even humans. Um, so, you know, we only have one earth. We may terraform some other planet sometime in the future, but that's not going to be anytime soon. Uh, we need the Earth for the foreseeable future, uh, so we need to take care of it. And environmental crime is one of those issues that's going to become a much bigger deal, a much more important and much more impactful issue in uh, uh, the foreseeable future. So 
Thank you for watching. This was a really important section, um, and I hope you learned.